I'll like just take it. Ah, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Thanks so much, Christina. I feel a bit funny in the middle. You wanna sit here? Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't <laughs> Good morning. Good, mo good morning, everyone. My name is Cristina Fuentes. I'm international director at the Hay Festival, and I'm truly delighted to be here today with all of you. Thank you for coming, talking about my favorite subjects, books and writers. So basically, I'm going to talk to you about Bogota 39. Bogota 39 is, um, is a project, is a selection and celebration of the 39 writers, the 39 most talented writers, and the DH of 40 from Latin America and the diaspora. We have done in the past projects like um, Africa 39, uh, looking at the region, at the African region, Beirut 39, looking at, uh, at the Arab uh, writers. And Bogota 39 um, came up in 2007 when Bogota was UNESCO World Capital of the Book. And uh, we, we, we selected the first list of the 39 writers. And it was a very interesting project because it was the first time something like that has been done in the Hispanic world. And um, the list was very well selected. 80% of, of those writers are the superstars of today, like Juan Gabriel Vázquez, Juno Díaz, Waladu Penetel, um, Alejandro Zambra, many, many more. And 10 years later, we, we saw that only two of um, those writers that's from that first list were under the age of 40. So we decided to do a new list. And, um, this new, and for this new list, we did a huge mapping of the region, a big research of uh, Latin American writers under the age of 40. And with the help of three judges, Leila Guerreiro from uh, Argentina, um, Dario Jaramillo from Colombia, three writers, and Carmen Bulluosa from Mexico. They came up with this um, astonishing list. Uh, these 39 writers are very diverse, they are bold and very, very talented. And what we did is we commissioned each of them a short story or an extract of the novels, and we created an anthology. And we wanted to pay homage to the independent publishing sector, so we um, we gave the rights to 12 to 14 different publishing houses in Latin America, in Spain, to publish the book. So each edition is different. This is the, the one from Spain. And we are truly, truly honored to work with One World to, do the, to have the anthology published in England and distributed in the, in the English-speaking world. And One World has worked as well with 28 translators. So the project is, has got another layer, is even richer in English, I think translation adds a lot. And um, before I give the microphone to the, to the table, I'm going to introduce you to the 39 writers. We, they all met in Cartagena de Indias this year. Uh, apart from the anthology in all over the Latin American world, Spain and England, we're going to invite them to all of our festivals in Latin America, England and elsewhere. So, Carlos Manuel Álvarez from Cuba. Frank Baez, Dominican Republic. Natalia Borges Poleso, Brazil. Giuseppe Caputo, Colombia. Juan Cárdenas, Colombia. Mario Javier Cárdenas, Ecuador. He writes in English. María José Caro, Perú. Martín Felipe Castañet, Argentina. Argentina. Liliana Colanzi, Bolivia. Juan Esteban Constaín, Colombia. Lolita Copacabana, Argentina. Gonzalo Eltes, Ch Ch Chile. Diego Orlán, Argentina. Daniel Ferreira, Colombia. Carlos Manuel Fonseca, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico. He's here with us today. Damián González Bertolino, Uruguay. Sergio Gutiérrez Negrón, Puerto Rico. Ja Gabriela Jauregui, México. Laia Jufresa, México. Mauro Libertela, Argentina. Brenda Lozano, México. Valeria Luiselli, México. Alan Mills, Guatemala. Emiliano Monge, México. Mónica Ojeda, Ecuador. Eduardo Plaza, Chile. Eduardo Rabasa, México. Felipe Restrepo Pombo, Colombia. Juan Manuel Robles, Perú. Cristian Romero, Colombia. Juan Pablo Roncone, Chile. Daniel Saldaña, París, México. Samantha Schweblin, Argentina. Jesús Miguel Soto, Venezuela. Luciana Sousa, Argentina. 
Mariana Torres, Brasil. Valentín Trujillo, Uruguay. Claudia Ulloa Donoso, Perú. Diego Zúñiga, Chile. And these are all the different covers of Bogotá 39 in different countries. A ver, let me see. Yeah, this is in Colombia, Uruguay, Perú, Estando Mudo. The content is, is the same, but the, the covers is, they are all different. Ecuador, Spain, Chile, Argentina, Nicaragua. And this is the anthology that, that will be published in May this year. So now I give the, the voice to, to my colleagues. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Daniel Hahn. I was one of the translators of this volume. Um, you saw me running in a moment ago. I should just say that I knew I was going to be a couple of minutes late because I was doing another event, so I asked Christina if she could talk very slowly. Those of you who know Christina know that that is actually her talking. That's, the, that's as slow as I have ever heard her talk. Um, she's done very well. Lots of deep breaths. It's lovely to be here with Carlos, with Sophie and Christina to talk about um, the book which is coming to talk about the stories, the writing, and to talk about the process of translating, having two translators here. Um, just very brief introductions before we get going. To my immediate left, Carlos Fonseca, as you've heard, is a Costa Rican writer now based in the UK who's one of the 39. His first novel in English, Colonel Lagrimas, um, was published by Restless Books, translated by Megan McDowell, whose name you will hear a few times, I suspect, in today's conversation. Um, to Carlos's left is Sophie Lewis, who's a translator from French and from Portuguese. Her books include um, Blue Self Portrait by Noemi Lefebvre, which was uh, shortlisted for the Republic of Consciousness Prize very recently. Sophie's also a past uh, editor. Um, she has a story by a Brazilian writer, Natalia Borges Bolesa, in this collection, which I'm going to ask her about. I'm going to ask her also about working with Brazilian writers in this context, because Brazil is is sort of part of Latin America, but only in a, a slightly odd way, as we will tease out a little bit, and I say this as a Brazilian who has strong feelings about these things. Um, and at the far end of the stage is Christina McSweeney, uh, who is a translator from Spanish, who's won the Valle Inclán Prize. The writers she's translated include Valeria Luiselli, Eduardo Rabassa, and Daniel Sardegna Paris, all of whom are in the Bogotá 39 uh, list, and all of whom she's translated for this collection. So, it's lovely to see you. I'm going to start by asking you just, just to introduce the stories you have in this collection. And Carlos, maybe I'll ask you to say something first about um, the Southward March, which is your contribution to Bogotá 39. Well, thanks so much uh, to everybody. Thanks so much, Cristina. Thanks so much to One World and to you, Danny. I'm very happy to be here. It's great to be able to represent Bogotá 39. We had a wonderful time in Cartagena. I think it was very productive to be alongside, for the first time, the 39 of us uh, in debate, trying to think what it means to be part of this group and how we can now proceed to write books that incorporate these sort of uh, debates that happen there. Um, related to the piece or the fragment that is included in the anthology, I would say one thing, I was thinking yesterday about it, and I think that we all grew, the 39 of us, um, in a landscape that happened after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the civil wars that the region, Latin America, endured throughout the 70s and the 80s, after what some people call the end of history, and in a way our relationship to history and politics was different from that, for example, of the authors of the Latin American boom. So we didn't have history with a capital H, as perhaps they did. And in a way, I see throughout the anthology an attempt to reconcile this, this lack of history with a capital H by joining intimate stories or like private stories at a more everyday level with the level of like history and politics. So in um, this fragment, which is... Uh, a fragment from my last novel, Museo Animal. Um, you get basically a snapshot of a family, a family of foreigners, as they begin their political journey through the Latin American jungle, looking for a anarchist commune. And in a way, what I am interested, or what I think I am interested in, 
is trying to tie the level of intimacy, the level of micro-history and micro-politics with history with a capital H and politics with a capital H. In Spanish, we have a very nice way of joining two words at once. Historia means both story and history. So in a way, uh, throughout the book, I try to play with this double meaning of the word historia. Uh, so I'm just going to read a very brief fragment so like, you get a sense of like, how the voice works. At times, in the landscape's crowded calm, the only sound is the camera as it flashes. For that brief instance, all that exists is him, the camera, and the impression that will be left to a future that he still doesn't know, but on which he has bet it all. For that brief instant, nothing exists but him and his belief, him and his future. Then, subtly, he's interrupted by that quick sonata that returns him to the middle of the jungle, the background sound of the rolling tropics, the cacophony of birds, the fluttering of uncaged chickens, the snore of a tired native, the fluttering, no, sorry, the hiccup of some drunken Englishman. Still further off, in a terribly singular and painful space, the sobs of the daughter whose plaints he only now hears again. Only then does he take his eye from the camera and look at her. And I must say that this is a translation by, by Megan McDowell, and I'm very grateful. Um, I'm, there are a few things that you've mentioned, particularly to do with what, if there is something the generation has in common, what they have in common. I'm going to come back to that. But I just want to pick up on one thing that you said, Carlos, and completely in passing, before I go on to the others. You said something like, this is what I'm interested in and what I think I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, is, do you find out what you're interested in by writing? Is the writing? Does the writing happen first, and then you go back and go, there seems to be quite a lot about post-history in my writing? Exactly. Yeah, no, I think like writing is all about playing in the dark and daring yourself to go out there. And once you have done it, you really figure out what you, what you wanted to say. Otherwise, it would be boring as much for the writer as for the reader. Mm. And in a way, I think like festivals are um, the right space for those debates that come after writing to happen. And the, so, you, that's how, so you surprise yourself. That's yeah. how you surprise yourself, by looking back and going, yeah. it turns out I can see these particular bits of DNA in yeah. the book. And then readers sometimes just come to you and like kind of clarify things for you that you don't, hadn't realized that was, they were in your mind at the moment of writing. And translators. Translators do this. We do this by writers all the time. It's, <laughs> it's terrible. Um, I do, you find yourself as a translator saying to a writer, I notice you, you keep using this word or you keep coming back to this thing. And they go, no, I don't. And you say, count, PDF, count how many times you've used this word. Um, Sophie, would you say something about the, the, the story you translated for this? It's one of, so Brazil is represented in the collection, but there isn't a huge amount. So tell us a bit about yours. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Can anyone hear me at all? Yes. Okay. So the story I've translated um, is called Perhaps an Animal, and it is about a woman whose life is not turning out as she had just, she didn't have big expectations, but she thought it would be better than this by now. She's, uh, she's in her mid-30s, she has too little money, uh, she doesn't really have a living going on and she doesn't really have much family and it, it she goes to a party and she meets a guy who surprises her um, and I don't want to tell you the story but the ease of partying and and the ease of encounter is something that I think of as as Brazilian city living um, and the closeness to serious poverty for somebody who would consider themselves a bit middle class and potentially safer than that is also something I see in Brazilian cities. Um, yeah. Can you say something also about translating particularly? Because I want to talk about translation generally in this conversation, but I wonder whether there are particular things, obviously some things are easier to translate or harder, some things throw up particular challenges which are linguistic or which are cultural. What was the experience of translating this particularly like? You can say it's, it's, just, it's a really easy one. It, it wasn't easy, but it has easy language in it, and that was its mm. trap. It, its trap was appearing easy, and, and the ease being hard to translate. Mm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a hard thing to, mm. to 
fake, isn't it? Right, and, and, and colloquial stuff, uh, the, the word stuff, that kind of thing. Hmm. The kind of chat you have with your flatmate who you're cross with is, uh, is I think, quite hmm. difficult to get as right as it should be. Right, hmm. got it. Interesting. Christina, you're, you're in an interesting position because you, first of all, you have three stories. We're going to talk, I think, about Daniel's story, Daniel's story in Paris. But can you say something particularly about coming to, so this is all, this is mostly new stuff, but it's, these are writers whose work you know. So you're yeah. translating people for whom you have some sense already of the kind of language they like, the kind of pulse of their writing. But what's that like coming back to a kind of a sort of familiar territory for a translator? Um. Very positive, I think. I was just talking this morning with a, a literary agent about this pressure for new voices, new names. And I feel there's a real sense that we want to consolidate the authors that we're working with. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to return to an author, mm. to see how their work's moving and progressing. And in fact, the um, story I'll tell you about by Daniel Saldana Paris um, is an extract from a forthcoming novel which he sent me the first 50 pages of in manuscript form and I've seen it progress throughout a year or so and that for a translator that's the most wonderful thing you know sort of but I think with all my writers it's it's a delight to go back but to that, but that's an unusual it's an unusual kind of access isn't it because even as a translator normally what you get is the thing when it's ready to go mm. and it's ready for you to work on rather than the thing which is still kind of contingent and malleable and still. Maybe I'm a little bit strange in that way because I've had a lot of collaboration yeah. with my writers so that their work has changed in the process of translation. It's never, you know, been a, a word for word hmm. kind of... Well, I remember I'm editing an anthology with the people from the Hay Festival a couple of years ago which included a story by Valeria and we asked her to send the original, the Spanish version, <laughs> and she said, I can't send it till Christina's finished translating it, because the Spanish isn't fixed until I know what Christina's going to do in English. <laughs> Which, by the way, was very this annoying for the rest of us. Wasn't because just we could, making we, it Do you remember this conversation? <laughs> no, but I think um, maybe for writers as well, sort of seeing the process of translation, you know, sort of um, helps them think about ideas within the book mm. that you might want to rethink in some way just as you might a second edition of your, your own novel mm. in any case so I think translation can give that sort of access to the original author as well as the mm. translator. Tell us about Danielle's story. Okay, um, Danielle's story is an extract from a, a novel that will be published in Spanish in September this year called El Nevio Principal and it's um, a first-person narrative by a man in his early 30s, I think. And he's looking back at the summer of um, 94, when he was 10 years old. And he's constructing memory, which I think goes with what Carlos says, you know, about the history of this, this uh, deep construction of memory, of the events that happened then when his mother uh, left the family home and went to Chiapas, Chiapas, sorry, to be part of the Subcomandante Marcos Zapatista army. And somehow, as, a, as an adult man, the, he's paralyzed, he's bed bound, he's telling this story from his bed, and you have the sense that something happened that summer that somehow paralyzed his life. And so that's it. Thank you. Can we hear just a little, just a few lines of flavor? Teresa left one Tuesday around midday. I can't remember exactly which month, but it must have been in July or the beginning of August because my sister and I were on holiday. I always hated being left in the care of Mariana, who systematically ignored me for the whole day, barricading in, in her bedroom with the music playing at volume that, even to me, a boy of 10, seemed ridiculous. So that Tuesday, I felt resentful when mum got up from the table after lunch and announced she was going out. Look after your brother, Mariana, she said in a dry monotone. That was the way she generally spoke, with hardly any intonation, like a computer giving instructions or someone on the autism spectrum. I sometimes imitate her now, remembering or making an effort to remember that remote, neutral voice and trying to reproduce it. Thank you. 
I'm going to, Sophie, I'm going to ask you in a moment to read a little bit from Natalia's story, but I want to pick up, Carlos, something that Christina was talking about in terms of her relationship with her authors and the idea that this text, that, that, that there is an impact on the authors of being translated, which isn't just there are more readers to access. Can you say something about your experience with Meganor generally of, being, of having translation uh, perpetrated upon you rather than these people who actually do it themselves? Yeah, well, like between what Christina said and what you mentioned before, like I think, I think translators are the more attentive readers that you could ever get, right? So when he you says were this with the translator on either side, so of course this is. So I, I want to survive. <laughs> you can ask him for his, for his 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 real views afterwards. But it's like correct. That's the right. Yes. It's the right. It's the right thing because like they sure. pinpoint, for example, what you were saying regarding ticks. Writers, we have ticks, and uh, you sometimes don't even see them because uh, they're ticks. They, they become invincible for you. And in translation, this becomes very evident. And the translator tells me, okay, as you mentioned, you have used the word como si se tratase, as if it was a matter of 200 times. And uh, I hoped, I wished that I could work alongside Megan all the time, in a way, because I think that as you were mentioning, Christina, in relationship to Valeria, it would clearly like clarify my style. It would like help me uh, be conscious of certain things that I'm using too much, and so on. Um, and the other thing for me that is interesting is that like since I speak or read English, it is I always have a preconceived notion of what the translation would sound like in English. But then Megan delivers something that is completely different and yet much better than what I had imagined. It's like a strange thing. It's like. Mm different from what, how I imagine my voice to be, but different in a good way, which is usually... And you expect it to be the other way around. You expect that you have your internal voice, yeah, yeah. actually. So, so Sophie, you're, you're, in this case, this is a writer who isn't, unlike Christina, a writer you've been translating before. But I wonder, think about what we were talking about, whether, as, as someone who has experience being an editor, whether there is also a sort of where there is a kind of editorial voice working when you're translating as well, whether one of the things that's happening is, is sort of second-guessing how to make this thing as good as possible, which isn't, which isn't quite the same as translating. I think it's pretty hard to divide the editor eye and the translator eye. And it's not just because I do both, but I think it's quite easy to be an editor as you translate, um, which isn't to say you're being a terrible translator or... Or, a, or overstepping the mark as a translator, but, but that you are reading. Yes, I think you're right, as, a, as an extremely careful reader as a translator. So you're a, a reader who is attentive as you're reading. You're not reading in full absorption. You're reading with question marks popping up everywhere. Um, and as you say, the editor is, is hoping to make a text work. and. Uh, the translator needs to recreate a text that needs to, to work with other readers who, who have not got the context. That's mm. pretty much the definition, isn't it? Mm. Um, so there's an editorial job going on, right. for sure. Mm. Would you give us a little taster yeah. of Natalia's story? Yeah. Oh, hang on a sec. Okay. So this is one of the one of the Brazilians. I am, I'm actually going to start from the beginning. I didn't want to, but I'm going to. I don't know why I was resisting. Uh, so this is perhaps an animal by Natalia Borges Polesso. Her hand shook slightly the moment she touched the warm, moist plastic. She seized the bag, heart in her mouth dread that anyone might have seen. Turning the corner, she ran right into Marcia. She hid the bag behind her, as if she could will it to be invisible. This was not Elvira's year. Hi. Hi, what are you doing around here? I'm going home. Oh, right. Come into the party tonight. What party? Igor's. Uh, maybe I, I have to go now. I've got to get to the bakery, then home, then I need to pick up some things Flavia wanted. Better get going now. Bye. She ran a little way ahead, then looked back to make sure Marcia was out of sight. She sat down on a rock. Leaning on the fence, edging a piece of waste ground, she looked inside the plastic bag. Risotto. Still warm. 
People who throw out food think someone can eat it just because it's kind of packaged up, she muttered to herself. She didn't know what to do. Thank you. I'm quite glad you started at the beginning, even though you weren't sure, because actually it's, it is quite a good... One of the things that that conveys is that mixture of... There's narrative, but it's quite dialogue-heavy, the story all the way through. And that thing you were talking about earlier, about getting those voices, those really casual voices, just right, is a very difficult thing to do in, in, in a way that is natural, but it's also not specifically London, specifically wherever. It's so hard. It makes me think of failure the whole time. It just... It's, it just Dialogue cannot be perfect when you translate. I, somehow I feel that it's so specific. It's so much of the place where it's spoken and the people who are speaking mm. it. I can talk about risotto. It's not the same risotto that you'd make for yourselves, but it's still risotto. Yeah. Whereas the dialogue somehow, I don't know. It can be, or as perfect as anything can be. Yeah, I guess so. It's great, it's really good. Um, I want to talk about the list generally, actually, because there's such an interesting range here. And Carlos, I'm going to start with you, because you said something about um, this generation of writers having a different having a different attitude towards history, capital H, towards politics. Is this a generation of writers which also has a different relationship to literature? I mean, to this thing that you do. Is that also distinct between what you're doing and, and the boom writers? Yeah, I think like... Well... We are basically the generation that grew after the end of everything, in a way. It was also the end of literature. We grew up like hearing people saying, the book is dying, the book is dying, the book is dying. And yet we wanted to be writers, so that was a bit scary. Because we didn't Not know sure London Book Fair is the right place for you here at this yeah. moment. But. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, a, it was a scary moment. Mm. It, was, um, it was a tricky situation also regarding to your relationship as an author towards the stuff that you were writing. Because in a way, um, I think the Latin American boom authors, for example, they, they were given the task or they conceived of their task as narrating the history of the continent in a moment in which the continent was in everybody's eyes, right? Mm. I think the generation perhaps that came before us, the generation of Bogota 39 of 2007, already started shifting this paradigm and started telling stories that were much more like everyday, quotidian, personal stories mm. and shifting the focus already from history and politics towards much, something much more intimate. I think in our case, we, were, we are still struggling to find a medium or like a media point, medium point between the purely subjective and the purely personal and yet something that has returned, I think, in the past like decade, which is a return to politics. We all started writing after 2008, after the crisis, in an economic situation that demanded from us an answer. Mm. So I think, and, uh, and nowadays, I think that would be one of the possible like, uh, debates that I think are happening within our writing without us knowing. It's interesting that we, when you described what the, what the boom generation were doing, you said something like they were interested in, in writing the story of the continent. They were telling this, this, that particular story. And I wonder whether that's what they're interested in doing or that's what those of us who are outside yeah. wanted them to be doing. There's a really interesting thing. So the introduction to this book is written by Gabby Wood and one of the things she talks about is the way that identity was forged from the outside. Yeah. And inevitably, to some extent, that's what happens when we look at this list, those of us who are not there. Even possibly you as someone who yeah. may be from there but you're now a Londoner as well. Yeah. Whether one of the things that's interesting about this list is what, what this generation looks like from from a kind of external perspective, and that may be where we see, yeah. and maybe the only way of seeing what the the congruences are, what the trends are. Yeah, it's interesting because I think even it even happens at the level of the continent. So Latin America is composed of so many countries, and to conceive of what is Latin America is an exercise that we all do kind of through imagination, right? Mm. So I was born in Costa Rica, raised in Puerto Rico. For me to like conceive of myself in continuity or in coherence with an Argentine writer or a Mexican writer already forces me to like imagine from the outside something that is not there to begin with. So I think like something like this is a project that allows us to like think through these continuities in a continent where distribution, the, I'm sorry, distribution of books is very hard. So for example, uh, for a Mexican author to arrive to Puerto Rico it's very hard. 
Um, and one of the things that I think uh, Bogota 39, 39 and this anthology in particular bets upon is in the power of uh, independent publishing houses, which have increasingly emerged in the region after the crisis of 2008, as a medium of like, you know, another way of distributing books that is not the traditional way of having to go through Spain and then coming back to Latin America, which I guess is in a way also like exporting models from, from foreign lands to like uh, right. conceive of Latin America as a unity. Right. Sophie, how does Brazil fit into this? Because, so you're, as I said, you're, one of the stories, you, you, the story you translate is one of the Brazilian stories. And when we try and find ways of generalizing culturally, politically, anything in Latin America, trying to define what's happening in Latin, Latin America now, Brazil is always something else somehow. What's Brazil, what, what is Brazil doing exactly in this continent? <laughs> this, is, this is always a strange one because Brazil is so ginormous. It's this huge majority of the continent by itself. Um, so dominant spatially and just when you look at the map also the projections of the map mean that it, it appears even bigger and uh, yet many if we're looking from the outside at the continent and trying to conceive it people don't realize that there is not a dialect difference but a full-on language difference and and I think it comes down to the language mm. um, I think the there are questions is Brazil part of Latin America well I mean it it's part of South America we can argue about this but it it does not have much back and forth contact there is not really literary exchange or not much of it I think I suppose Buenos Aires is maybe the sort of hub if we have to choose a single capital of literary production and so there is some kind of back and forth between well Brazilians will go there sometimes I think that's about what you can say, but there just, there just isn't much traffic between the literatures of these countries, but between Brazil and the rest, there's pretty much a barrier. I think people talk more often about barrier than any kind of exchange. Right. Um, and there isn't a very good reason for it. People can speak to each other in their languages without learning the other person's language, and I think that might be a small reason as well. There are, there are, we, understanding can be achieved on a sort of day-to-day -day food purchase basis mm -hmm. and meeting the family type basis, but that means you couldn't necessarily have a Brazilian read Carlos's book. Mm -hmm. um, would they publish? I, I, yes, it's, it's, there is just genuinely an ongoing barrier, mm -hmm. non-communication situation, um, which is very strange. And in fact, there isn't a Brazilian publisher for this book so far um, and that's one of the things I wanted to have a go at but it, I know it will be difficult because mm. there'll be a lot of translation to be done and there aren't enough Brazilians to to read it <laughs> no no in it <laughs> in it <laughs> to, they, well to, they to, obviously to aren't enough I mean yeah. that's, the, that's the other thing mm. proportionally Brazilians will not be very impressed <laughs> it's true. Mexicans on the other hand Christina it, it, it's an interesting there's an interesting kind of flip side to what we're saying about Brazil because Mexico is not only well represented in this book with some great writers it's also much better represented in the English speaking world the, the three writers you translated are writers who have English language publishers um, and there's something about you know I think there are certain writers who've kind of led the way and we mentioned Valeria in the introduction who I think kind of a lot of writers kind of came into English in her wake. But even Mexico, talking, we're talking about this kind of generalizing about this big continent, but can we even generalize about Mexico? Is it possible to look at that generation of writers just from this country and um, generalize about the sort of what's happening in that literary world? Yeah, probably not in a way because I think there are many different strands. I mean, what became known perhaps at some point in time was the kind of Norteño, um, writing which has a lot to do with the narco and sometimes a bit sensationalist for my taste but then you know sort of you've got much more kind of Chilango writing from Mexico City which has a different thing um, I think for me when I think about Mexican writing I can't or what's happening now especially in particular for women that you know Valeria I think became a sort of point of reference for women's writing in Mexico, something people could react to 
or reacted against or whatever, however they felt about it. But, you know, sort of, she was like a, a, a groundbreaker of getting women's writing in Mexico through into more mainstream things, you know, rather than being sidelined. And I think that's had an influence on the whole of the writing culture, you know, male writers as well. And, yeah, so... It's, it's very diverse, it's extremely div- diverse what's happening, but it's also an amazingly creative moment, I think, for Mexican writing. For me, it's, you know, doing some of the very best in Latin America. Did that answer your question? It absolutely did. <laughs> Thank you very much. Carlos, who are the other, the other writers you're excited about in this collection? There are some, obviously there are some who are known in the English-speaking world, yeah. we've mentioned a few. There are a lot that are, that are not yet and hopefully will be. But I, I presume that one of the things that's nice for you about being in this collection is you're, you're, in, you're in interesting company, aren't you? It's not just everyone thinks you're great, which is very nice, but also you're surrounded by a really interesting group of people. Can you say something about the, the other people who are on this list who, who you're excited to be sharing? Yeah. No, I think like also in an almost political way, it is very important to have these anthologies because there are certain regions that for which the writers of those countries it's very hard for them to gain visibility perhaps because their national markets are smaller let's say central american writers uh, caribbean writers uh, bolivian writers equatorian writers so i'm just gonna say i i like all of them but uh, i'm gonna mention some of the names of those countries that are perhaps uh, a little bit less visible I was very impressed uh, by Monica Ojeda, uh, whose first novel I read, Nefando, it's uh, marvelous. Uh, Maro Javier Cárdenas, who actually wrote in English uh, and now got translated into Spanish. Uh, Sergio Gutiérrez Negrón from Puerto Rico, I think it's somebody who works with intimate voices uh, in a very impressive manner. Uh, Frank Baez, a poet and narrator from Dominican Republic. Uh, Liliana Colanzi from Bolivia. Um, these are authors that, in a way, it would be very hard for us to get to read them if it were not for these sort of platforms, because our countries, um, it's harder to get to the major markets like Mexico, mm. Argentina, Spain, and Colombia. Um, and I remember when I was growing up at the age of 21, I wanted to interview Latin American authors. And back then I didn't know who was the new generation and I looked for the previous list of Bogota 39 authors and that's how I got to know who Sambra was, who like Alvaro Enrique was, uh, Pilar Quintana and when eventually three years ago the editor asked me who do you want to be translated by, I said I want to be translated by Megan McDowell because I had read her doing Sambra. the Sambra translation. So it all goes around. Yeah. I want, just before we open the question, I want to ask the two translators something about what well, Carlos was saying about the difficulty of getting certain writers, of, of helping certain writers to travel. And I'm always interested, as a translator myself, in, in the role the translators can play, not just in translating, but also in helping to bring writers into a language, helping to bring writers to a publishing market. Um, Christina, maybe I'll ask you first. Uh, you were involved at the point of uh, when the publisher was deciding to acquire Valeria's first book, as well as actually translating it. So can you say a bit about your role, um, or how you see your role, not just, not just translating, but also being a person who reads the books, knows the books, recommends things to publishers? Because as, as Carlos was saying, it's one of the things that's very difficult is, is the kind of process of first discovery for a publisher. And you as a translator have an important role in yeah. well before any translating happens. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it's not always the case. I mean, sometimes things come to you, but I think, you know, sort of as, as you progress in your career and you're reading new authors, things like that, you know, sort of you can have influence with publishers. You can go to them. You can tell them about things. They don't always listen to you, but you keep trying. Um, I think it's a very important um, think for translators to be aware of that we do have that influence you know that we are the best readers in the world and we are the people who are going to know that book best we can tell the editors about it and I think often we forget that we do have that power uh, to do it and you know it's it's a very important thing as well it's a responsibility 
you know, because you don't want the wrong kind of stuff to be published. So, yeah. Sophie, is this your experience as well? I mentioned at the beginning that you have French and Portuguese. Portuguese being much more unusual for translators, which affects both in what you can translate, but also the fact that you know some of the writing. You've lived in Brazil and you know this literature. So do you have, as, as Christina does, that experience that you have a kind of expertise which will help to break down the barriers that Carlos was talking about? I, um, I think about it all the time, like that. I, I really do. It, it's, it's, um, it's something that I decided when I was thinking about learning Portuguese. Um, it's, it's definitely an expertise. Publishers mostly don't have many languages. Um, they particularly don't have the ones you can't learn at school. And um, I really always intend to read more Brazilian writing because I know that if I can tell someone I found something really amazing, then I might be the first and perhaps the only person who's ever come to them saying I've got this incredible Brazilian book because there aren't that many people who can do that. Um, you can do that, but there aren't that many. And uh, and yeah, having there is there is the relationship with the publisher to think about, which Christina touched on. You do have somehow to be in a position of some trust. Um, they have to think that you have an idea of what they might like to publish and what could be amazing. But also, you can tell them this is brand new. This is this is different. You've never read anything like this before. Let me get my hands on it and translate you a bit. <laughs> There's nothing like that. That kind of recommendation. And it really is absolutely part of the job of being a translator. Which yeah. is sort of how Valeria happened, because Christina read the book and you, for, for Grant and then bullied them, basically, didn't you, until they did something about it? I'm not bullying. <laughs> I <laughs> pleaded. Not. Plead, plead, plead. I threatened suicide <laughs> if they didn't. You do whatever, whatever it takes to get this book into English. Um, and I should say... It's one of the things that's, that's exciting about this book is there's so much great work by translators in it. Um, I was really pleased that Gabby Wood's introduction talks about, she mentions particularly the, the translations in the book, not just these 39 great writers, but also the translators whom she describes as not only uh, elegant stylists, but excellent listeners, which I think is a really perceptive way of thinking about what translators are doing. Um, we have a, a little over 15 minutes, and I promised I would let you uh, make comments, ask questions, so I will shut up now. Um, we have a roving mic, so <coughs> any questions or comments? The woman in the front, <laughs> completely unfamiliar woman in the front. You know, I would like to ask Dan about um, um, the writer you translated and if you can read a bit as well. About? The writer you translated, it was Felipe, no? I, I, so I translated uh, ex, uh, two writers. Okay. Felipe de Estepopombo and Martin Felipe Castaniet, uh, one of whom has a book in English, um, the other one is yet to be discovered, but, but Felipe de Estepopombo is coming to Hay. Uh, so six of, I don't know if you mentioned this at the beginning, but six of the writers are going to be at Hay Wales this year, Carlos is one of them, and Felipe is uh, one of the writers I translated is going to be there as well. Um, yeah, anyway, there's a... Are there plans to translate into other languages? And if so, um, how are the rights going to be managed? Is that a question for Christina or for oh no, Juliet here as answer. well? So the question, if you can hear, the question is about the plans to translate the anthology into other languages. So it's published in Spanish. It's coming from One World in June in English. Um, so the question is whether there, whether there is also going to be... Yes, I mean, at the moment, Hey Festival, we hold the rights. Rested. The big challenge is obviously translation, mm. but uh, we will be very happy to see the book published in other languages. And we we like to we would like in this project to work with independent publishing houses if possible, as we have done with Latin America, Spain, and and the UK. And the fact that actually you just mentioned that there isn't one publisher for the whole of the Spanish-speaking world. So that's also quite, that's a decision, isn't it? Exactly. It was it was a conscious decision. We wanted to pay homage to the to the independent publishing sector in Latin America and Spain, and there are 14 different ones, and uh, you can see there the Colombian one, here is the Spanish one, and uh, you know, it was a conscious decision. We basically gave them the rights for free, and uh, of course you have to publish and print, and so that was part of the project, to celebrate not only the wealth of, um, of voices, but as well the wealth of uh, independent literary publishing houses. Mm. 
Yes. Is that one of the things, then, Carlos, coming back to what you said a moment ago, that one of the, thing, that the benefits you get from this is actually uh, in the Spanish-speaking world, that you have a kind of presence in this anthology with 14 different independent publishers yeah. in Latin America and Spain? That's a complete. That's that's a sort of a, a completely separate bit of collateral benefit for you as a Spanish language writer. Definitely. Yeah. Nothing like that has happened before. Like 14 different publishing houses publishing the same content in different formats. I think Juliet wants to say something. Juliet is with One World Publisher. Juliet may be from One World. Hi, I was just going to say on the subject of translation. I think um, we had we didn't have time because we needed to um, publish by June and we had to translate. But if a, if another language uh, if another language publisher wanted to um, translate, there's a possibility they could approach several of the different countries and ask for translation support. We didn't we we didn't have time to do that. But I think others, yeah. Or I, I don't know about Spain. I, I think they would need to go back to each of the individual countries from whom the writers represent are represented. Well, or maybe, oh. yeah, may, may, maybe the Spanish government would help. But anyway, what I'm what I mean is that yeah. you you could appear, uh, um, apply to the different countries for translation support, but we didn't have time. But others yeah. could. But there are certainly there are a few countries that have quite a few writers. Yeah particularly Mexico and Colombia and Argentina are, are represented with a number of writers each. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yes, at the back. I'd like to raise the issue of some of the smaller Latin American countries. If I were a Venezuelan writer, I wrote a novel in Spanish in Venezuela, the chance of it appearing in English are close to zero. But the chance of it being read in Spanish in Guatemala or in Bolivia and Uruguay are not much above zero either because of the internal distribution. How do you address that? E-books is obviously one way, but are there better ways to address it? So if you didn't hear, the question was to do with something we mentioned earlier, the, the, the smaller countries and how they're represented in the bigger picture. So, for example, a Venezuelan writer, not only how they get into the non-Spanish world, but also how they travel within the Spanish world, and with this kind of structural problems with actually getting read. Yeah. Venezuela and writer being read in Uruguay or wherever. Um, I could perhaps say here, uh, since I lived in Venezuela for a number of years, and I'm very well aware of, of the difficulty of getting Venezuelan writing out. Um, a year or so ago, there was uh, an anthology of Venezuelan writing published here called Crude Words, um, which really included some of the the best of Venezuelan writing, but. It's, you know, and I'm, I think it's partly to do with infrastructure, um, the problem of distribution of writing within Latin America. Things don't get distributed easily as we might think here in, in the UK or in Europe. Um, and going back to what Carla said earlier about this necess necessity of a Spanish publication, mm -hmm. that's still true in Venezuela, certainly. I think all we can do is keep trying and keep pushing it and keep talking to people about these authors that we admire and just not give up until we get something. Christina, do you have a, 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 a wish list of Venezuelan writers you want to translate? Or is there, or is there a book? Oh, the top of my list absolutely is Victoria de Stefano and the whole of the English-speaking world should be ashamed of her, itself that her work is not in English language translation. She's a brilliant, deeply respected writer, and I keep talking about her. Yeah. She's I, amazing. I, I thought you might. Yeah. <laughs> she, you, 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 yes. So, so English-speaking world, sort yourselves out. A <laughs> uh, question from Srila, and then we have a question over the side. Oh, we'll do it the other way around. Yes, one here and then come over to this side. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just wondering how are the new voices found? What process does it entail? How are these new writers? Thank you. The question, if you can hear at the back, the question is... Oh, okay. So can we, can we just pass the, 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 the mic to Srila as well? But she has a connected question and then we'll ask Christina to answer them together. Um, I was just wondering, within the sort of uh, literary and publishing culture in Latin America, how much of a, of a um, uh, process is going on to discover unheard voices from the indigenous communities? 
Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. So, Christina, if you say something about the process of actually selecting these 39, and then I don't know if you have. Okay. So, okay, so basically, the, what we did is we did a huge research. We commissioned a research of uh, young writers under the age of 40. They have to be published, and the criteria was quality and potential to growth. And we gave the whole research, you know, chapters of the books and biographies, prices, to three judges that are well, well recognized writers Carmen Bulloso from Mexico, Leila Guerreiro from Argentina, and Darío Jaramillo from um, Colombia. And they together came up with the 39 list. So we gave them a long list of 200 names, or even more, 250, and they narrowed it this down, um, down to 39. The first time, 2007, it was done as well by Colombian writers, uh, Hector Abad Faciolinche, Oscar Collazo, San Piedad Bonet, and, uh, and that's how they selected it. And the, yeah, indigenous writers, you want to answer? Yes, I don't know, Carlos, if you have any, any views about this, because it's underrepresented, I mean, not just in this collection, but just generally in the Spanish-speaking market, yeah. isn't it? It's very, it's very hard because it involves already a process of translation within uh, the continent itself, right? So you would translate from Quechua or Mayan into Spanish and therefore it's an, another step. I come from two countries in which the indigenous population in Puerto Rico is non-existent and in Costa Rica is barely minimal. Um, but I do know that there is like efforts in Mexico and Peru to translate mainly through anthologies which I, I was thinking when, Christina, you were mentioning before the, the role of the anthology, the anthology does provide a format or a genre where you can like, first put into visibility a lot of people at once without having to bring a book at once. So I think there's still a lot to be done, uh, particularly with indigenous voices. And um, I think that one of the easiest ways is through the platform of independent publishing houses that like, are doing more immediate job in the ground of like uh, locating voices without having to go through the very um, layer process of like you know agents and then translators and distribution and so on so there's there's an immediacy to independent publishing ha that is uh, i think provides uh, a possibility for for such efforts christina in mexico such, such as it's happening it's happening with poetry more isn't it and yeah. insofar as anything is being translated from languages other than spanish it's poetry yeah it? i think there's a lot to, of work being done in terms of trying to, to um, increase diversity within the, what's been published. Um, also, I think sometimes we have a tendency to think in very separate terms so that somebody is, what, Mexican or indigenous, uh, and yet an author who I've just published, whose work I've just translated in the United States, Ulian Ebert, is of mixed heritage, very much mixed heritage. And, and yet he perhaps won't be seen as an indigenous writer because he's not speaking an indigenous language, but his culture is very much half indigenous. So maybe sometimes we are a little bit too stereotypical in the way that we actually perceive, you know, sort of these categorizations. And Sophie, in, Bra in Brazil, we obviously have the same problem, don't we, that not only what's being published there, but also how it's being seen abroad. You remember a book I did when Sophie was working at, an, 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 at And Other Stories, I translated a book by a writer called Paulo Scott, which, Nowhere is the, yes. called Nowhere People, which, which is the first book really to have a woman, an indigenous woman at the centre of it, which was already kind of groundbreaking, but of course written by a European, white European man. Yes, yes, a man from the south of Brazil, uh, from a centre where people get published, a man with law and letters at his fingertips, and also she doesn't have a happy story. Mm. Um, I, think, I think in Brazil they're, they're, there's a fair amount of, I suppose, black consciousness um, and slave keeping history is being um, somewhat belatedly sort of addressed in some yes way. Yeah. but I think that the indigenous population has a fair way to go before it's going to recover from pretty much just habitat destruction and and rights whitewashes mm. and I think having some kind of literary presence as that as an indigenous population is a way away really right. in I Brazil agree. yeah uh, we have time for one more question I think 
Do we have any last questions? We're just going to sit here and stare at you until you ask us a question. <laughs> Would you like to, anyone like, oh, there we are. We can have one from you, thank you. I was about to ask you if you want to ask them anything. <laughs> I was just wondering if you want to get involved in projects like this, or are there going to be any more projects involving emerging Latin authors? <coughs> How can we get involved? Um, this is the second list we do of uh, Latin American as a region. We have done uh, similar projects called Africa 39, when Port Harcourt in Nigeria was UNESCO World Capital of the Book, selecting and celebrating 39 of the best, not the 39 best, 39 of the best. This is not a canon, this is just a sample of African writers. We did as well Afri um, uh, Beirut 39, when Beirut was UNESCO World Capital of the Book in 2010, selecting the most interesting Arab writers under the age of 40. We did last year, in, um, as Orhus in Denmark, was European Capital of Culture, we decided to select the most interesting 39 writers under the age of 40 for children and young adults from Europe to celebrate them in Aarhus. So we're always looking into, into, you know, into regions, into new voices, uh, new blood, uh, and you know, we're open to this kind of, um, of projects. For um, Latin America, I think we need to wait another 10 years, but, <laughs> but you know, we're always doing that, that kind of um, selection, celebration, and yeah, things like that. So you have like eight and a half years to do some seriously good writing <laughs> for Christina to find you in 10 years' time. Uh, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Do uh, look out for the collection, Book 39, which is going to be out from One World in June. Uh, if you can get yourself to Wales on the last weekend in May, you can come and see Carlos and five of the other writers. And actually some of the previous list. So Juan Gabriel Vasquez was in the last Book 39 list, and he's going to be at Hay as well. Um, so you'll get to see... A, a, a little bit more from these writers and read about them in this collection. Uh, but all just remains for me, I think, to thank our three speakers, organizers, and uh, Christina, Sophie, and Carlos. Thanks so much,